The union's argument is that lots of public money is going into the infrastructure, it's going into the production capacity, but the labour's not going with it. Your argument is that those jobs on the assembly line can be reallocated to your industry, for an example. That's right. I think this is going to be a redistribution of jobs. It's clear that the number of labor that it takes to produce an electric vehicle is 40% lower than that of a combustion vehicle. Jim Farley has said this. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the industry today, three years ago we had two battery manufacturing plants across the U.S. Today we have 30 either live or planned to go live over the next four years. By the end of the decade, we'll have 20 times the battery manufacturing capacity that we did in this country at the start of, this, at the, start of the decade. The fact is the redistribution of jobs will happen. It won't impact everyone the same way. But going from jobs that pay today 18 to $32 an hour to jobs that will invariably pay more in the battery manufacturing sector, that's fundamentally what's happening. And the UAW strike against the automobile OEMs is not fundamentally about their employees or their labor. It's fundamentally about the UAW because those that they will not be there to support battery manufacturing as well as uh, chip and semiconductor production. You have hundreds of fast chargers here in North America. You're active in Europe as well. Uh, are you in a position where you're like, okay, the money's coming from the Inflation Reduction Act. Are you in a position to offer jobs to those that are currently working on the assembly line and are, wo are worried about their future? We have jobs that are available for UAW workers today that are displaced. But the fact of the matter is we won't be able to take all of the demands that these OEMs are, are, are have to uh, give up. So there are hundreds of companies in the space, from battery manufacturing to charger technologies, that are absorbing many of these jobs. And similar to what happened in the transition from fuels to solar, a lot of the jobs went into the solar industry, high-paying, distributed, dispersed jobs that uh, are seeing great results right now. Arkady, it's interesting you bring up solar. Solar is another industry that was highly dependent on China really and you're seeing that same issue here at play with battery making here in the United States we're just hearing from Chester Dawson about Ford being blasted by the UAW itself at the moment for putting on ice that three and a half billion dollar battery plant because it was going to be working with CATL how much are you having to get supply chain from China how much do you think jobs in the US are dependent on an ongoing somewhat friendly relationship that's right Carolyn I think there is a concern that some of the battery production and as well as chips and semiconductors, charging infrastructure will come from the Chinese market. But unlike solar, I think the Biden administration has taken a good look at that ahead of the blossoming of this industry. We've already put certain tariffs in place on battery uh, cells coming in from China. And we've incentivized U.S. domestic manufacturing of chips, semiconductors, charging infrastructure, and batteries all across. That is, so we expect this this market to play out a little bit differently than it did in the solar industry. Freewire, particularly because of the incentives that are in place, we've transitioned all production out of China. Mm. In fact, we only have one single supplier left from China for a small, inconsequential part. The vast majority of our other suppliers are coming from the U.S. and European markets. And more broadly, therefore, you have seen incentives with which to do this. Can the industry eventually be standing on its own two feet without the necessary sort of help with an IRA or indeed ensuring that, well, you're getting the right labor at the right time without the incentive process there? Yes, I think so. And you can see that, that corollary happening in Europe. Whereas in the U.S., we use the carrot via the in incentives. In Europe, they really use the stick and said, by 2030, you're unable to drive electric or you're going to pay 25 pounds by going into the city of London if, unless you have an electric vehicle. And the business model there works. You can see that as adoption ramps up in the U.S., 7% of all new vehicles sold last quarter were fully electric in the U.S., 25% of new vehicles sold in California were fully electric. As adoption happens, the business models start to turn and work. So I am encouraged to see that while we do need incentives to get through the next two to three years, while adoption is still low, we won't need them by the end of the decade. What's your assessment, Arkady, of, of the lasting or near-term impact of this? You're hopeful, of course, that more people buy electric vehicles and use your chargers. But do you see that this, this temporary halt talks between the UAW and the OEMs is going to impact production for the next year, 18 months, and therefore the availability of, of EV models right now? That's right, but I think a lot of that demand will shift to the to Tesla. Frankly speaking, they're still one of the largest adopters, uh, still one of the largest producers of electric vehicles. Um, this is only going to solidify their market dominance. And so, while we will see fewer makes and models of vehicles from the traditional big three OEMs, there's still plenty of supply and capacity available for consumers to to pick up.